Hi everybody, I hope you're well. My name is Mike Harmager. I uh, work across many different um, provisions across education and health, but you might mainly know me from working um, in special educational provisions um, and alternative um, provision settings. And I also work in mental health services with young children, um, sorry, young people and adults too. I hope you're okay. Um, it's difficult at the moment, isn't it? There's lots of uncertainty, there's lots of challenges that we're all facing. And I think what's what's really key for me is to get across the, the messages to those key workers that are still going in, that there are resources that we can share with you, that there are networks that we can make sure that we include you in, and that there are things going forward that we really need to think about in terms of our wellbeing policies and just really taking care of people that take care of people. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes talking to you now and I'm going to share some resources with you. Um, these are resources that I've shared with everybody in the general public recently, but it's important for me to show you the resources in this webinar so that it's not just me talking, it's also um, the, the fact that you can then go out and follow up these um, afterwards and have a good look yourselves at the resources. So we'll make sure that we send all of those over to you too. Just so you know, um, this is gonna last about 10 minutes, um, um, maybe 10 to 15. So if this is too much for you right now, um, and you don't have that time, you can come back to this at another point if it's a little bit overwhelming right now to sit and have to listen for that length of time. Um, but for those of you that, 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 that can manage that, um, now this uh, is what I'm going to talk to you about, the three main areas. The three things I want to talk to you about today are hygiene anxiety and how to support young people in school settings with those. And then I also want to talk to you about um, identifying anxiety patterns and persistent patterning. And then also I'm going to give, share a website with you that I've also put together um, with NHS colleagues um, uh, after funding from NHS England. There's a lot of difficulty right now in terms of changing to routine and that's particularly challenging for many of us who are working in settings where routine is absolutely everything for some of our learners and our young people. Changing routines can sometimes really affect people's psychological safety and their sense of certainty and that really can be a challenge for both the young people, the parents, the families and ultimately ourselves who are in charge of implementing those routines. Some of the things that I think we need to think about around routines firstly are if they are informed on a individual level or a mass level. Sometimes at the moment we're not going to be able to use effective routines that are going to work for everybody. We understand that and it's about sometimes mitigation rather than prevention. So it's not necessarily about panning out the perfect routine but it's about making sure that if we know that there are going to be problems with the routine but it's the only thing we've got available to us at the moment with the restrictions we've got then what mitigation factors are we, are we uh, are putting on an individual level to make sure that we mitigate the effects of those positively for our learners and our young people. So that's just a quick word about routines. I'm going to share with you now um, a resource around hygiene anxiety, which is something which I think is really important right now. Um, so excuse me whilst I share the screen with you at the moment so that you can see it. So this is um, a, little, a little laugh for everybody as well. Uh, my name is actually Mike Arminger. You'll see here that um, they've decided to change my name to Mike Arminger or Mike Arminger. I mean, whatever you want to say, that's okay. Um, but um, I put together this um, very um, simple graphic. Um, and for, no, that's a lie. Actually, Chatterpack did that for me. If you want some really good resources um, for online learning, for ideas around STEM, it's just it's a collation of resources on a web page, basically. Go to chatterpack.net, you can check them out on Twitter as well, and the email address at the bottom of the graphic. They're really good at collating resources and just putting a load of links together. So they put this graphic together for me after some thoughts that I that I'd originally put out. So I don't normally refer to obsessive behaviours um, in terms of OCD, as it's, as it's often known as. I tend to talk about heightened anxiety around specific areas, mainly because not everybody who has an existing diagnosis of OCD will, um, uh, will, will always um, show symptoms and behaviours in the same way. Some people also will have no um, previous history of any element of obsessive um, or any elements of compulsiveness um, around these particular areas. So it's really important we don't just call it obsessive compulsive, that we broaden this out because these are understandable reactions sometimes to the wealth of information in this current climax. But particularly for children with historic um, and previous um, obsessive um, and maybe um, what we would call again compulsive um, concerns. These anxieties may be extremely heightened right now but it's important that we think about this for everybody okay this isn't just that particular demographic of children. So a couple of things that I'm going to talk to you about are 
understanding um, just some different areas in which this might play out and some basic practical things that we can do to think about those things too. But the one thing which um, is really important point is whether or not our hygiene practices are visible or not. So for some children that will really reassure them um, if they're particularly anxious or about hygiene currently. And that might be useful, but for, for others, for some individuals that you might be working with, um, actually seeing those hygiene practices may also be a little bit more unnerving. So it's not to say that we obviously don't do them, because of course we need to, but it's thinking about whether or not there's a way that we can just be maybe a little bit more subtle if that particular child is around at that moment in time. It's those little nuances, I think, that just allow those psychological factors of safety and certainty to take place. The other thing to think about as well is that many of our young people will be on social media. Um, and they will be um, using it quite a lot and quite well, um, I think, at the moment, to connect with other people, especially teenagers. So one of the advice, bits of advice that I'm giving people in terms of social media is, and this isn't necessarily related to hygiene, it's just a general point, um, is to think about how actually, instead of just blocking um, news or not going on it, we know that ultimately many of them are going to go on it, but it might be instead about actually muting keywords. Now, muting keywords, you can do this on Twitter, you can do this on different um, social media platforms. So, for instance, you can go onto the search filters and you could say, you know, mute this word, coronavirus, etc. And it allows them a news feed which essentially hasn't got those words in. So, it just gives them a safe space, maybe, that they can use to connect and interact with, find all the useful bits of social media without those difficulties of overwhelm as well. So going back to hygiene and um, think about bathroom use. Now we all uh, we don't all have the ability to use different bathrooms, of course, you know, and actually it's important that we keep bathroom practice um, and hygiene um, you know, very routine and very normalised for many of our young people. But for some of them, they might actually worry about using toilets um, that are universally accessible to others. So maybe it might for certain individuals where it's appropriate and where we need to, to think about maybe toilet facilities that aren't always necessarily universally accessible. So think about maybe using disabled toilets for some of those children that really need that extra, um, that extra level of hygiene care. The other thing to think about with parents as well is that if they're particularly worried about getting things on their clothes or on their body, then it might be appropriate for us to think about sending spare clothing into the school. Um, it's not to say that we're encouraging children to change out of those clothes. You know, we need to explain that obviously, you know, actually there's lots of things that we can do and we're going to be safe distances apart, all of those different things. And for within physical and um, distancing guidelines, but we also might need at some point, you know, it might be the case that somebody without intention, you know, touches or, or makes contact with clothing. And that might cause a significant amount of stress. So it's just thinking about whether or not for the time being, they might need some elements of spare um, clothing in school. The other thing as well is that if you do have pets on site, um, if you have therapy pets, this might be a heightened um, anxiety for some children at the moment. So, you know, normally they're very soothing and they're very, um, and they're very useful. Um, in, in our school setting but at the moment they might be seen as potential risks so have that conversation um, if, if it's useful for the young people but understand that, that might also even though we know that those those types of animals that you'll have in school can't necessarily transmit um, presenting facts on that might be very important for that conversation with young people but also thinking about just ongoing whether or not for the time being actually you know, there's not necessarily a way that we can persuade them at the moment that pets are not going to be able to transmit but might we be able to maybe uh, mitigate that by just not putting them in areas maybe which are universal to that child. The other things to think about as well is actually have they got the ability to have their own sanitizers or cleaning products rather than using others and that might be a source of worry and concern for them too. So think about actually whether or not um, they are able to come into school with those um, sanitizers. Um, I know for a lot of people that actually might not have them um, at home and that many of our families are not going to be able to provide those so actually it might be the case that if we've got some in school, a small one, maybe it's about where we store it. So maybe they have to go to a specific place. Maybe the routine is, is that they need to watch their hands to go to a specific place for that. That might tie in with other things that we've already discussed. So again, it's professional judgment and that's, that's down to you to make that call. You know your children absolutely best. The other thing to think about is surfaces too. Again, thinking about whether or not those visible hygiene practices and wiping surfaces regularly might cause anxiety or alleviate it again and it's a professional judgment for you to make but also think about actually excuse me, just the, the screen. also think about um, whether or not it might be important to think about um, cloths for, for certain um, surfaces too so they might be concerned about actually touching the surfaces or um, possibly putting their books on top of them so think about whether or not they might need a tray or they might need something to just shield them from those surfaces 
um, or just something um, additional, whether or not it might be the fact that they might need a plastic cover over their book. Again, another thing for us to use professional judgment with. The last two things, um, also think about whether or not at the moment, if they're using a fidget toy, how that might be cleaned regularly. Very important that we think about that because that's also going to come in touch with a lot of services and a lot of different things. So just count that in with our hygiene routine too. Allow them the choice to get some of their own equipment, maybe if they're particularly worried about getting certain things. Maybe in my case, that you allow them to, um, to store them in a specific place, specific area, or you allow them to go and touch them themselves rather than um, somebody else getting it for them. Again, professional judgment for you. Last thing, we're excessively washing our hands a lot at the moment. That might cause a lot of um, worries um, and physical um, dermatology. Uh, uh, can't say that word. Um, in terms of dermatology, you think about actually whether or not they're excessively rubbing their hands and, and the scrubbing, um, which might cause pain. So it might be the case we have to just generally keep an eye on that and also think about maybe providing some elements of moisturiser or something they can get from home that might just soften their hands a little bit more and make sure they don't get excessively dry or excessively sore. So that's in terms of hygiene anxiety, okay? So that will be um, something which I think that many of us maybe are used to working with, the children that have already got those existing concerns and anxieties, but might be something we have to think about universally at the moment. Apologies for the shaking on the table and stretching my leg out. So another thing that I want to share with you now is um, a resource which is um, an anxiety site. So if you've been in any of my training, I have shared this with you before, but it might be really important to just revisit this at the moment. If you've never seen this before, it's basically thinking about um, identifying, oh, excuse me, um, identifying specific patterns around anxiety um, uh, shifts. So we all know with anxiety that it doesn't stay in one place, it shifts. And one of the things we know about demands, avoidance, and all of those things is that we have to think very carefully about how those patterns play out and what happens when we ask for specific things or with specific routines, how the anxiety shifts from one place to another. So this is taught for you to identify those predictable patterns and maybe um, identify cycles. Now, we also know that it's entirely unpredictable sometimes too, but this won't always necessarily work with all children. But for those who are seeing common patterns, this might be a really good idea for you to think about doing. So this was created by um, Sally Russell, who has done some wonderful work um, in uh, demand avoidance. But I don't necessarily use this for demand avoidance. I use this specifically for just general anxiety cycles. So, so this gives us the format. So you can see here is I find it hard to, when I find it hard to do something, I tend to do things like X, Y, and Z. What I can do depends on, and then not being able to do things means I'm more likely to, which means I am, and then back so you can see how all of these things are interlinked and how it all shifts around in one area. So I put in some suggestions here. So it might be, um, you know, I struggle to get out of bed in the morning or I struggle to come into the school in the morning. And um, when that happens, I tend to do things like pretend that I haven't heard an instruction, which then means that, um, uh, you know, all what I can do depends on the way that I'm asked to do those things and so on. OK, so we can see that it's all interlinked. Now, I've put these in here for you just as some examples. Okay, so these might be ones that go across the home as well as across, um, as well as across school. But what I normally encourage people to do is just leave them blank so you can put your own suggestions in there or your own observations. Um, so don't, please don't go through these and just tick these. Please use it as an editable tool so that you can just go through them and type in what you need to do, um, you know, in bullet points or whatever format you want to do. Okay, so that's just a resource that you can use for identifying what those um, factors might be. And it's also maybe a really good one to share with parents as well. And they might also link the hygiene too. So this might be a plan that you, you may be put together on the back of that. You will have existing formats, I'm sure, and existing plans. But I just find this particularly useful because it just, again, with predictable patterns or common cycles, it just gives us a really good physical representation of how those are interlinked and how they might map out. So it's something for you to think about um, in terms of that resource there. Okay, take a breath. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm Welsh and that I talk very quickly. So um, apologies for that. And I hope you don't need subtitles. My accent has somewhat dimmed a little since I've um, been, been living the other side of the bridge. So I'm going to show you um, one more. Okay. So I'm going to show you um, the latest um, resource that we've set up. Um, uh, a bunch of colleagues of mine, um, and the wonderful um, Alice um, Nicole King, who um, is a liaison psychiatrist in North Wales. Um, we are part of a group called For Mental Health, and we um, train um, health professionals and um, all agencies um, in suicide prevention, but also in general well-being and mental health. 
So this is a resource that we've just put together, which has been NHS funded, and this is for everybody to use, so both young people and also staff. Now, I'm really concerned at the moment that all of our um, well-being is targeted and all of our interventions and resources and thinking is targeted at staff. But we all, and sorry, targeted at children, but we all know that actually staff at the moment are not only having to worry about their own families, but also having to worry about so many others in really adverse circumstances. So this is something which I really want to share with all of you so that you can think about how you might use this as well as maybe how your young people use it. So learn www.learn.formentalhealth.com. Okay, and this is the landing page that it will take you to. A lovely picture of an umbrella. We've specifically chosen pictures that aren't particularly triggering and that are just very, very plain and, and a little bit and more hopeful. So if you go down to this um, link here and you'll click on find here ways to make me feel a bit calmer. If you click on this, it will take you to this page. Now, the first place that many people go to normally is either about the website or how you're feeling right now. So the how you're feeling right now scale, you don't have to do this by the way. Okay? This is just something which people can use so that it signposts them. If they say, well, I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm extremely distressed, it will take you through straight away different resources, both on this site and linked sites that we've produced so that it can channel you into the right area. Okay, so that's just basically a fast track tool that you can use. But for many people, they go into the two main practical areas, which is the wellbeing plan and also the 3330 approach. So I'm going to teach the wellbeing plan first, which ties into the 3330 approach. The wellbeing plan is, is this format. Okay, so you can see here it's got emergency reboot, 30 second activities, three minutes, 30 minutes, etc. Okay. So this is basically a format that maybe you can print off, that you can download, and you can use that um, with the advice from this section, which I'm about to show you, but also some of the existing stuff you've already got there. So I'm now going to show you the 3330 approach. Okay, so this has basically been designed for people who might not have excessive amounts of resource, who don't have financial means, technology, who don't have loads of different creative resources at home. This is specifically designed for them. I think sometimes we can be very um, almost middle class in affliction sometimes in our resources. So we'll go to a garden, you know, go outside and sit on a bench in the garden. Well, not everyone has a bench, not everyone has a garden. Yes, we have to think about making it as simple as possible, which is what I'm hoping will be useful. But the reason that we've gone for 33 minutes and um, 30 seconds, three minutes and 30 minutes is to again give that variation, but also not all of us have 30 minutes in our homes or in schools, be able to do some of these things. That actually sometimes we only maybe get 30 seconds. So it's taken us to links and understanding what we can do in those things that are simple and that are universal. So apologies, um, we've gone over 10 minutes <laughs> and it kept my connection off um, just after 15. So this is the second part of the video. Um, I apologize for going over, I will try and keep the last part brief so we try and get into the 20, um, 20 minute mark. I'm going to go straight back to the resource that I was just talking to you about, which is the, um, the 3330 approach. So, without going into too much detail, um, the, the 30 seconds um, ones are things that you can use to help understand how, um, if you've only got 30 seconds, that you can immediately use. So, it might be you as a key worker need to be able to take a breath and to be able to you know, use PMR. So, PMR is progressive muscle relaxation. So it's where essentially, and I use this a lot with young people, especially those who are really highly activated. Um, and it's those where you, you tense really tight, okay? So you can use different muscle groups, it might be your wrists, it might be your shoulders. You tense really, really tight, and then you let that go. And then it also um, shifts excessive tension as well. So it's just a really good way of using that um, in a short space of time. And um, it isn't necessarily a cognitive strategy. So these are the 30 second techniques that you can use. Okay, so again, it's very, very simple, very well broken down. Okay, and then the three minute ones are slightly more detailed and then they also contain links. So there's a box breathing video that you can use maybe. And there's the feet on the floor, bum on the chair technique. Um, there's virtual safe um, places. So I'm going to YouTube, I've been using recently and it sounds daft, but just, just at times I've just been, I just want a little bit of escapism. Um, if you go onto YouTube, um, I type in um, nature, um, natural um, beauty, Amalfi Coast, which is one of my favorite places to go in Italy, um, which I've been very fortunate to go to. You can, it, can be, it can be somewhere in the UK, it 
could be something down the road from you, it could be a child's family, it could be lots of different things. And it's just basically a little bit of music to some scenery, nothing complex. Here you'll also see on some of the three minute approaches as well, there's things like butterfly hope, listen to common sound, all of those different things that you can use um, within three minutes. So it's just building those ideas. And again, some random things as well, you know, how to peel banana like a monkey, how to uh, tie your shoelaces, etc. And then on the 30 minute ones, it gives you a little bit more detail um, in terms of the things that you can do, um, which maybe give um, a little bit more nuance, but also think about how we connect to people, um, a meaningful task, all of those different things. And again, it gives you more links to go to, okay? Lots of information on there, I'm aware. But the one that I want to take you to is linked to this website. And it's one that I've, again, talked about in my training, but many of you might not be familiar with it. And it's for those who really are struggling right now and who will really need some support going forward. Um, those people who are in significant distress can go to the top right hand corner here, okay? And they can go straight to some of these numbers here, but they can go straight to the website, which we've also designed. And um, this website has been up and running for about a year and a half, okay? And it's called www.stayinsafe.net. Now this is specifically for people who are um, experiencing suicidal um, thoughts or thoughts of self-harm or who are in very overwhelming amounts of distress and we think that might possibly be the next step. So try and, and direct them to this um, website where it has a range of helplines that you can call. But on there, what it also has is that it has introductory videos um, on there. You will see my face on there, please don't be alarmed. Um, but it also gives you some videos and some resources and explains how you can possibly go about doing this, okay? So if you go onto the safety plan tab, this is the main feature of the site, and it'll take you through how to make a safety plan electronically, okay? So again, there's more guidance videos on this. You don't have to go through all of them, but they might be useful for you um, if this is the first time coming across this resource. So this is where you will end up, okay? So this is the electronic safety plan, and you can see here it's a really good format um, and you can go into each box and this is basically to try and help um, mitigate and plan for those times where somebody might be experiencing those thoughts of significant distress. This has to be co-produced, this has to be something which is effectively done with both the young person, the adult and yourselves. This is not a clinical tool, it's used in clinical services, we don't have to be a clinician to use it. This doesn't necessarily need to be used directly by you as a professional, you might signpost a family member or somebody else to this resource, okay? So I am aware that you know, it's quite an overwhelming um, time for people um, and that this might take up a huge amount of space and, and might be very difficult. So know that there is guidance on the site there that you can access, but it is a really practical tool which is really useful to help people understand what might happen um, during those times and what they could do to mitigate against that. So in here, if you just type in some input, okay, um, you can put uh, all the electronic input in there and then you can also get some ideas. So you can hover over some of these and click on them and it will give you some ideas that you can click into there as well, okay? So it's not just that it has to be all of your own um, thoughts and ideas, it has to be co-created and co-produced. That's really key and really clear, but there are also some additional um, things that you can put in there too. So when you close each tab, it won't then delete all of it, okay? There's still some stuff that's there. So really important that you know that. So don't worry about clicking between tabs. You can just add some different stuff in there. Um, and then on some of these, you can just add in more and more too, okay? And then some really important ones down here, some numbers and some things that you can call, okay? So on this page in particular, you can just add them in here, okay? So again, you can add specific contacts to, and then at the end of all of that, you can click download PDF, and then it will give you a downloadable version of that as well. So you can print it off the files, you can give people hard copies of it, but it can also go straight onto young people's phones if they've got them, or um, carers' phones, you know, whoever they, that needs to get to, electronically as well as physically, they have that safety plan for them, okay? So I've given you a lot of information there, and I'm very aware of that. Um, I've also gone over my promise of only being 10 minutes. <laughs> So very sorry about that. I hope that you are okay and that we're all managing this really unique situation in, in various different ways and, and it's really challenging for many of us. I hope that you have the resources that you need and if you don't, I hope that some of these resources are helpful to you and I hope that you have networks you can fall back on. There are many different networks that you can reach out to at any time um, and, and I hope that you know one thing we do get from this stage is understanding just how vital our key workers are. It's ironic, isn't it, that, you know, at the time where 
we've had many difficult decisions forced our way for many different years we've been under a lot of pressure you know we're now in the position where actually you know we're now being given that official title of key workers but we've all always known that our jobs are key and that we are really key for our young people our families our communities and our country so just know that we're all thinking of you um, i'm thinking of you um, across both the nhs my colleagues are also thinking about you as well um, and all of us as a profession have a real duty to look out one of the during these times Twitter is um, a great place where educators can, you know, discuss these things as well. It has a difficult moment, you know, as any social media platform. But, you know, if you're thinking about joining, you know, a, a, a social media site to connect with the professionals, now might be the time to do that. So reach out if you can um, and you're able. And I hope that some of these resources have been useful to you going forward. Take good care and I'm sending you lots of love and light and positive vibes. Take care. <laughs>